Hello and welcome to another Show Me. In this one, we're going to be talking about a tract called the Cortico Bulba Tract. And this tract is often taught in relation to the corticospinal tract. Both are voluntary motor pathways. The corticospinal tract, of course, goes to the trunk and limbs, particularly the lateral corticospinal tract, travelling to the uh, distal limbs. And the corticobulbar tract is in, involved in voluntary movements of muscles of the head and neck, and uh, that it means that it involves a number of cranial nerves. So the best way of doing this is to kind of draw out a representation of the spinal cord, and I'm going to do it a bit like this, very simplified diagram. And we're going to have the cortex kind of over here. It's not enough room, I'm just going to draw that. I'm going to pop the cortex in here and the cerebral cortex. And so, much like the cortico spinal tract, we are going to have alpha motor neurons traveling primarily from the primary motor cortex, but also from those association motor areas, the premotor area, and of course the supplementary motor area, and a proportion coming from the primary sensory cortex. These ones which would, in the corticospinal tract, travel to ramify in the dorsal horn to amplify proprioceptive information and dampen down pain signals. This time, they, these are going to travel to uh, cranial nerve 5, which is the main sensory nerve of the head, and particularly to the trigeminal nuclear complex, where it will have the same role to play, making sure that proprioceptive information is fed back and that uh, other modalities such as pain and temperature are dampened down slightly. So pretty much the same setup in terms of the origin of those alpha motor neurons. However, we do have to have a think about where they're going on this occasion and they're going to the brainstem. So let's just draw our midline on and we can label down here, this is the medulla. This is the pons, which is slightly wider, and up the top here we have the midbrain. Now, we're also going to draw on our nuclei. So up in the midbrain, we are going to have the nuclei which belong to ocular motor. So we can draw those in here. Just draw them as circles for the time being. So we're going to have, so we can label that, we can say that's ocular motor. I'm just going to abbreviate some of these because I don't have too much space. The next one in here is going to be the trochlea. So I'm going to put troch there for that one. That's again in the midbrain. Coming down, you might remember the trigeminal nuclear complex. Well, in the middle of that, where the chief sensory nucleus lies, we also have the motor nucleus of trigeminal. So that's going to be in there as well. So let's put that on. So this is going to be trigem. And next in line, we are going to have the abducent nerve. Ab. I've done that the wrong way around, haven't I? Let's get that rid of that. Hang on one second. Let's do that properly. Have do that's better. Let's get on our next cranial nerve, which is our facial nerve. Now I'm going to have to draw that slightly larger because it's actually got two motor nuclei. We'll come back to that in a moment. We've also got our glosso and pharyng glosso pharyngeal nerve and our vagus nerve. They share a nucleus called nucleus ambiguous, but we're going to put on the uh, the nucleus anyway. So it's nucleus ambiguous, but essentially it's a single nuclei shared by glosso and vagus. We've got our so we're down in the medulla now. We've got our accessory down here, and we've got our hypoglossal as well. So let's label those. So we've got accessory and hypo. Okay, so our fibres then coming from 
the cortex over here are going to travel through the internal capsule, particularly through the genu of the internal capsule, that's really important. They're going to pass, before that, they're going to pass through the corona radiata, and at this stage they're pretty much together with the corticospinal tract. As they travel through the internal capsule, yes, they're together with the corticospinal tract, but while the corticospinal tract occupies the posterior limb of the internal capsule, the corticobulbar tract occupies the genu uh, of the internal capsule, which is the bend, the kink in that boomerang-shaped uh, area of white matter. So we can draw the fibres coming down here, and the fibres are going to bilaterally innovate most of these nuclei. So off to ocular motor and over to the trochlear nerve. This is a, a kind of biological insurance for each of the cranial nerves in case we get lesions. So as we come down to trigeminal, we've got a bilateral innovation there as well. As we come down to abducens, that's again bilateral. The facial is slightly different and we have to split this into an upper facial nucleus and a lower facial nucleus. And the thing here is that while the upper facial motor nucleus has a bilateral innervation, the lower one is contralateral only. So that's definitely an important point to remember. Glossopharyngeal and vagus, bilateral, accessory, bilateral, and when we come down to hyperglossal, slightly different, contralateral only. So the odd men out in this scenario are our facial nerve and our hyperglossal nerve. These are particularly vulnerable with lesions or stroke because, as you can see, the lower face on the contralateral side will be affected because it only has a contralateral innervation, while with the hyperglossal nerve innervating the tongue, again, we've just got a single nucleus but a contralateral innervation. That means that often symptoms from stroke, classic stroke, can be seen as a sagging of the lower face on the contralateral side, while the upper face is spared because of that innervation up here to the upper facial motor nucleus, so we don't get symptoms around the eyes or uh, above uh, the level of the cheek. And again, with the tongue, the hypoglossal nerve will often show symptoms when the tongue is protruded. So clinicians will ask the patient to protrude the tongue and it should deviate to the side opposite to the lesion So because it's contralateral. So let's say that the lesion is in the left side of the cortex on the upper motor neuron. So all of these are upper motor neurons coming down here. Then the tongue will deviate to the right because it's the right-sided hypoglossal nerve which will uh, see the consequences of that and it will be weakened and the tongue will be pushed over by the good healthy side onto the side um, where the muscle isn't working and in this case this is a contralateral to the point of the lesion. So we must remember that the upper motor neurons are the neurons leaving the cortex and innervating the nuclei and the Lower motor neurons are the cranial nerves themselves. So we're just going to draw an example here using the hypoglossal nerve. And just to say that that in itself is a lower motor neuron. Okay, that pretty much wraps up everything I've got to say about the corticobulbar tract. I uh, hope you found that useful. Bye for now.